Good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. As we finish winding down on this Labor Day weekend, tonight we begin with a look at what could be a compromise in the gun debate. Smart guns. One company is developing what it's calling the personalized gun, a firearm designed to only be fired by an authenticated user, in this case using his or her own fingerprint. ABC's Ike Jachi takes a closer look. It's no secret, gun violence in the United States continues to grow. Every day, over 100 people die from gunshots. On a daily basis, gun violence epidemic. Five-year-old girl was accidentally shot and killed by her brother. The majority of Americans do want something done on this issue. According to the CDC's most recently published data, overall firearm-related deaths increased by 15% in 2020 to just over 45,000, the highest number ever recorded by the CDC since it began tracking firearm deaths in 1968. It's a growing uh, threat. Uh, it affects our, our health in, in many ways, aside from the, uh, the obvious, which is the injuries from guns themselves. Daniel Webster is the co-director of the Center for Gun Violence Solutions. He's been researching approaches to reduce community gun violence, especially through a public health lens. Traditionally, uh, we have thought of the problem of gun violence in a pretty narrow way, simply as a criminal matter uh, to deal with exclusively through our criminal justice system. By thinking of it as a public health problem, it really expands the way that you can think about potential solutions. Those are effective in reducing uh, uh, unintentional shootings involving young people, teen suicides, and juvenile perpetrated homicides. Another staggering statistic, the effect gun violence has on children and young adults. In 2020, the CDC declared firearms as the leading cause of death for Americans ages 1 to 19 for the first time ever, with over 4,000 children and teens killed. An analysis from the New England Journal of Medicine labeled the increasing firearm-related mortality rates as a preventable cause of death. But in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Ginger Chandler believes she has a solution. Right now, you can see a green light flashing in the rear of the light and in the rear of the firearm. It means that the gun is safe and it will not fire. She's the co-founder of Lodestar Works, a gun company developing a smart gun. Good shot. I locked it with the, the biometric this time. What we know is if an unauthorized person picks up that firearm in a time of stress or they're going to do something quick, they're not going to be able to do it. So the idea is you're the only person who can shoot this gun. That's right. I'm the only person. Three fail saves to make sure of that. That's right. First, there's an app on the phone. You can see it, and I'm just going to click it. The other way to unlock it is just a pin pad on the side. And it can be any amount of numbers or in it's terms of... It's four digits. Four digits, gotcha. Which is there's 5,000-something combinations, <laughs> right? And then if you put your fingerprint on that pad, did it unlock? No, it did not. It did not, right? <laughs> it, did not it won't. And if I do it, it'll unlock. Right there. In the past, the National Rifle Association has supported smart guns, while still raising concerns about the tech becoming mandatory for all firearms sold in the U.S. In fact, during President Biden's campaign, he called for all firearms sold nationwide to be smart guns. We should have smart guns. No gun should be able to be sold unless your biometric measure could pull that trigger. So realistically, could smart guns help lower the homicide rate? We might see some really big uh, safety gains from that. But where we are now, that's not realistic. Chandler, like many Americans, favor gun control laws. Do you still believe, though, that the idea of having more guns out in the market is a net positive? Or do you believe that having guns that are safer would be a, a net positive. Oh, absolutely. Guns being safer is a net positive. And more guns... Not less guns. Not less guns. I'm a shooter. I hunt. It is part of something I am involved in. It's a passion. It's I enjoy it. I absolutely respect the person who says we should not have any more guns. I respect their opinion. They have it for a reason. They have some bias or something that in their background puts them there. I respect that. And I just want the same respect back. Our thanks to Ike for that. Another major issue that is on the minds of Americans every day now is the rising cost of living, but especially when it comes to prescription medication. Part of the Inflation Reduction Act President Biden signed into law is expected to bring the biggest changes we've seen 
in a dozen years. Here's ABC's Devin Dwyer. After decades of promises to curb skyrocketing costs, Democrats say relief from health care inflation is on the way, especially if you use prescription drugs. This is a foot in the door for uh, health care cost, cost containment. When will people start seeing the savings? Starting next year, drug companies will be penalized uh, if they increase prices faster than inflation. Americans spend more on their prescriptions than anyone else in the world, on average $1,200 per person per year. When we met Laura Marston last year in D.C., most of these vials are expired. We saw firsthand how the soaring price of insulin these days, which is around $300 a vial, means having to save every last drop. I feel like I live in a country that prides itself on freedom, but I don't get to be free because at 14, I was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. Starting next year, millions of diabetics on Medicare will pay no more than $35 a month for insulin. Good news for retirees like Sue Milliken. I don't think anybody's happy with how drug prices have gone up. The Ohio grandmother says drug price inflation has been eating away at her fixed income. And the other drugs that I'm on have gotten very expensive on blood thinners, on certain uh, cholesterol medicine I've been on, they've been in the two to $400 range. But under provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act, by 2025, Sue and 50 million other American seniors won't pay more than $2,000 a year for all their prescription drugs combined. This cap on out-of-pocket costs for drugs will help the sickest people uh, on, on Medicare. So these are people with cancer, people with, uh, with HIV, people with blood diseases. The cost can, can really run up quickly if you're taking these expensive drugs, and, and this legislation will provide relief. The law also means big savings for taxpayers, an estimated $288 billion over the next decade, thanks to government now being able to negotiate down some drug prices for the first time starting in 2026. Everyone would feel it through a couple different channels. In some cases, it would mean less out-of-pocket at the pharmacy. Uh, in some other cases, it would mean less that we'd pay for prescription drug coverage. The motion is adopted. It's a historic change embraced by large majorities of Democrats, Republicans, and independents, even as drug companies lobbied hard against it. This Inflation Reduction Act is a lie. And every Republican lawmaker voted no. We want to allow innovation. I'm a doctor. So the fact that people can't afford their insulin, I am very aware of. I'm also very aware that part of the price inflation when it comes to insulin is not the price coming from the drug company, but rather the extra price added by the pharmacy benefit manager. Of course we make profit, but it's not like we keep it, right? We return it to shareholders who give us money to take huge risk on R&D. Lilly CEO Dave Ricks told us last year, though the company makes billions in profit, government-mandated lower prices will soon mean fewer experimental drugs coming to market. Five of the six medicines approved globally to treat COVID are from American companies, two from mine, and three out of the three vaccines that are used globally are from American companies. One independent analysis forecasts there will be two fewer drugs developed over the next 10 years because of the law and that launch prices of some new drugs could be much higher. I can see where it's happened in other countries where it limits how many drugs they get, when they get them how fast you can get stuff. And I don't want to see that happen here. What we really don't know is which drugs uh, might not come to market as a result of, of lower prices. You know, will it be groundbreaking treatments or, uh, you know, just me too drugs that don't really offer a whole lot of uh, improved health. For Laura Marston, the law is a major milestone, but with limited impact. As a patient who depends on insulin to survive, it wasn't as fantastic for us. That's because most Americans not on Medicare won't see any immediate change at the pharmacy. Those on private health insurance like Marston could still see prices climb sharply. Uh, over $2,000 worth of insulin. One in five insulin users pay over $35 a month for their supply, and that new $35 monthly cap won't apply for most of them. You know, health insurance is not guaranteed but I need insulin without a doubt for the rest of my life. I really implore Congress to, to seek out and introduce solutions that help 
diabetics in patients across the board. With the midterms approaching, further quick action by Congress is a long shot. Some states are acting on their own. 22 have capped insulin copays, but only for those on state insurance plans. Remains to be seen whether Democrats are able to, to build on this and, and expand the scope. Our thanks to Devin. We shift now to a really interesting look at one sector of our country that is experiencing shortages. American nuns. Simply put, there aren't enough of them, and they are having a hard time convincing younger women to take the vows. Senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami with this in-depth report. On this Saturday afternoon in Cincinnati, 32-year-old Colleen O'Toole is making an agreement with her God. In a moment that's becoming more and more unusual for a young woman in America, she's becoming a nun. The star I have for you today is called a big mooncake for little star. But Sister Colleen is a lifetime away from the cloistered nuns now in the sunset of their lives in convents that are closing left and right across America. She has subscribers to her videos on YouTube where she's known as Story's sister and reads to children. Is this a true to life story about Martin Luther King? Do you know who that is? On Instagram, like many people her age, she shares pictures of her food and cute photos with sunflowers, rainbows, and cupcakes. Sister Colleen, receive this ring. There's concern today that young people aren't interested anymore in a life of religious service. Between you and your God. And that there's a crisis in the Catholic sisterhood. Less than 1% of the sisters are under 40. And the average age of the American nun is now 80 years old. We had to make those outfits. Sister Joanne Persh just you turned 88 and says that so many of her friends who joined her in service in the early 1950s have gone home to the Lord. She knows what's happening, but says it's wrong to say that the place nuns have in society is going away. It's changing and growing into something we can't even imagine. But this year, there are now fewer than 42,000 nuns in America, down 76% from the days when they were so celebrated that on this very network, nuns could fly. I do not want you to fly while a bishop is on the island. You mean I'm grounded? More than any other religious servant of God, the Catholic nun arguably still holds a special place in the hearts and minds of people around the world. Mother Teresa was a nun in the church long before she was a noun in every dictionary, describing a person who is selfless and kind. I have a place you can hide. In the movies, it's the nuns who help families escape from the Nazis. Freeze! Leave them alone. They don't and help hide witnesses to crimes from the mob. But at the rate the sisters are disappearing, one estimate says there will be fewer than a thousand nuns left in the United States in 20 years. God's got big plans, and hopefully we follow them. <laughs> Sister Kelly Williams is working to become one of those nuns still in the life. She's 34 years old and started her journey nine years ago. She's put in more hours than she can count of community service and Catholic studies. Hey, you get this a lot, right? Yeah. Okay, what am I about to say? Like, I look very young. Yes. And I'm dressed normally. Yes. Or as normally as one of us. <laughs> yes. How can I do this? Because um, that's... Do I watch television? Yes. Okay, you, you know. watch television. Yes, do I watch Netflix? Or specifically in our house, we don't have cable, but we have, like, okay. Netflix and Hulu and all of the things, but, you know? But, you know, you don't really go out to bars, or do you? Not I, I don't go out to bars like I would have when I was in college. I think I've had people be cons like surprised that like I like to listen to music and not all of it is religious, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. She's a former college admissions counselor who lives in a Chicago apartment with four other sisters close to her age. As we pray together. She expects to take her final vows in a few years, officially becoming a Catholic sister with the Sisters of Mercy, one of the largest religious orders for Catholic women still left in the world. And she says she's not giving up her Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok accounts. I started making videos every Saturday. I make, you're welcome to follow it along. It's called Saturday Sisters Surprise. What do you think I might have hidden in my hair today? Is it a 14-pound turkey? 
Yes, it is. It's something that has brought a lot of joy to people. And every time I go, okay, I think maybe this is time to like end it, I'll get a message of someone who's saying like, I've had a really hard week and I look forward to Saturdays. And I'm like, oh, then this is why we do this. I feel like I should probably get a better view. How does the sisterhood get more sisters who are in your age group? That is the question for the ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know that I have the answer to it because I think the reality is there was a time in history when people entered in droves. And sometimes because they had no other place to go. There are so many options that are available. It's about being called to this. Like I, if I could, if it was about recruitment, right. you could be in a different game. I see. But you aren't. Yeah. This yes. is about God's call and responding to that. But part of that means like, how do I talk about my experience as a religious so that someone else can go, oh wait, I, I think I've heard things like this, but I didn't know what it was. And maybe this is my own call. She and her roommates explain that young people today are more resistant to the structure of religious life and that many are turned off by the scandals of the Catholic Church. And they say that even though the Catholic sisters haven't been required to wear religious clothing since the 1960s, there's a tradition that frames what they do and who they are that as young people, they struggle to work past. The American memory is attached to the nun of yesteryear. Yeah. You know, and it's very hard for us now to kind of be breaking through those stereotypes that were established 50, 60 plus years ago. So we are still kind of fighting that battle as younger religious to say, this is what a typical American nun looks like in today's world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They pray every day for their future, asking for strength, hope, and more young women to answer the call. Bless our sister. As their scriptures tell them, God has plans. And empower her to be a living witness of your love to all your people. Coming up, a look at a silent epidemic and how our nation is hoping to save lives. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right guys? Bring your friends. Oh wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital, and then I just see Shimani as... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. 
Welcome back. It is a dark and sometimes invisible epidemic. Suicide is a major public health concern and is among the leading causes of death in the United States. ABC's Trevor Alt takes us to the windswept plains of Wyoming, where people there are hopeful a new government service will help save lives. I've never been angry at my son. I've always been angry at me. The seconds pass inevitably. This year, Lyle Nyberger should be 33. Instead, he stays 17, forever frozen in the memory of his father, Lance. As you get into it and talk to other people, all of them say, we're in a life we never wanted to have. We're all in the cowboy up attitude. You know, you, real men don't cry. Real men don't have problems. Was that something that you subscribed to? You know, it's, it's spread into me. We all have problems. We all have something go wrong. And we all need help at times. And when you learn that you, you don't need help and, and you just go on, maybe that makes life a lot tougher. They say in Wyoming there's two seasons, winter and wind, sometimes bitter and biting, others just a whisper. But when you're here, you feel it. And these days, the same can be said about suicide. In a region known morbidly as the suicide belt, Wyoming has the highest rate in America. Its impact so widespread, it feels as present as the wind. Hey, and I'm Lance Nyberger. I'm the chair of the task force, and again, thank you for being here. The Natrona County Suicide Prevention Task Force is well aware of the problem. They meet once a month in Casper to plan events, pool resources, and keep track of the lives lost. Top of mind today, another first responder has died by suicide. Well, two days ago, we had our sixth for the year, and it was a first responder on duty. That's a big number in a year to have that happen. And there's a number of factors putting Wyoming at high risk. Many residents are isolated. And with more guns per capita than anywhere else in America, residents have more access to lethal firearms than mental health professionals. One University of Utah study posits the altitude could be a factor. According to a Gallup poll, the Mountain West is home to some of the happiest Americans, and yet it consistently has higher rates of depression and suicide. Year to date last year, my officers had responded to 256 persons who were considering suicide. And uh, this year, we have seen an absolute negligible change. And so year to date from May 15th, 253. Here in Casper, Wyoming's second largest city, police respond to suicide calls twice as often as they do for shoplifting. 16 years ago, one of those calls came from Lance when he found Lyle at home. Lance had no idea his son was suicidal. No note was left behind. How often do you think about Lyle? Daily. There isn't, isn't, uh, a day that goes by that I don't think about him now. After his death, you know, it was, it was horrible. And I came to a point where I realized that it was Lyle's decision and his decision only. In this area, this is a widespread problem. Why do you think that is? There's a lot of things going on. One of them is, is Wyoming's a rural state. By landmass, Wyoming is the 10th largest state in the country population, it's the smallest, meaning even if you wanted help, help might be a long way from you. This is what you see in most of Wyoming. You'll hit a major town about every 100 miles. And when I say major town, I mean a town of 5,000 people. You might get a call from somebody that's, you know, 100 miles away from the nearest town. Um, but you might also just not have the mental health professionals. Wyoming has been a mental health shortage area, always. Federal legislation to help any American in crisis reach a counselor by phone launched July 16th. But in this state, even that will be an uphill climb to adopt. 
I'm familiar with 911. What's 988? So 988 will be the new three-digit number for the suicide lifeline. What does that mean specifically for Wyoming? You're not going to find a cell tower every 50 miles or so here. And so making sure that we are meeting those infrastructure challenges is probably going to be our biggest, most expensive long-term project. 988 is being touted as a one-stop shop for anyone experiencing a mental health crisis. But funding the project so that health care providers are ready for the influx of calls is proving to be challenging. The Department of Health and Human Services expects the volume of calls to double within the first year. However, according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, only four states have enacted a concrete plan for funding. The Central Wyoming Counseling Center is one of just two suicide hotline centers already up and running in Wyoming. It opened just two years ago. The workers there know this state's layout, its culture, its resources or lack thereof, all of which is essential in a crisis. CWCC Suicide Lifeline, may I help you? They've secured $2.1 million to expand the suicide hotline into a 24-hour service. I'm glad you called today. Most of it federal money from the American Rescue Plan Act that Governor Mark Gordon appropriated. But with the state legislature refusing to expand Medicaid, that federal funding will soon run out. There's still a lot of work to make sure it's prepared for the rollout. Absolutely. And then the funding also runs out Absolutely. in two years. Yep, we're going to be very busy the next year. So what happens if, hypothetically, you know, a person is 150 miles from the nearest crisis center or hospital mm -hmm. and they call because they're in a crisis? Well, we roll out what we have in the area. Well, which might, I mean, if they need that level, if there's an imminent risk of death by suicide um, and law enforcement presence is needed, then we'll roll them out. Around Casper, that happens often. As we sit down with Police Chief Keith McFeeders, he tells us his officers are responding to a suicide call as we speak. The state of Wyoming is very much deeply indoctrinated in what I would describe as the cowboy culture. There's a cowboy code of ethics um, that really embodies, look, you know, whatever, whatever the world can throw at me, I can, I can find my way through this. But suicide and mental health are things that you, that you may not be able to just kind of pull yourself up by the bootstraps and see your way through. With this culture, it can be a bit like the fact you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. It's my job then to put water everywhere I can. I can make enough resources available to him that at least they know where to find it. And many who know the depths of suicide firsthand refuse to treat it as a foregone conclusion. It's like you living in this negative I guess, self, self-made hell. Jason Whitmire attempted suicide some 10 years ago. He now works with Lance on the task force to stop others from doing the same. I would imagine that there's a, a bond that you would have with people that know these dark depths. Yeah, there is. But you don't get that feeling until you know their story. You can't bond if you don't know what they're into. That's something Lance Nyberger still thinks about when he reflects on the loss of his son. He didn't feel comfortable enough to come to me and say, Dad, <laughs> life's kicking my butt. Uh, I'm, I'm really struggling here. And at the time of his death, when he needed me the most, I wasn't there for him because we were going in opposite directions instead of working together. The messages that you give to someone who's lost someone close to them, that kindness that you extend to help them deal with that, do you extend the same kindness to yourself? I've gotten better at it. For about six months, I didn't care whether I lived or died. It wasn't until our daughter gave birth about seven, eight years ago to our granddaughter, I really realized what I would have missed had I not lived back then. Wyoming has been referred to as just a small town with unusually long streets. And here, everyone seems to know someone who's dealt with suicide. For Lance, there's both horror and strength in that sentiment, that everybody is dealing with something, that pain is a universal burden we carry. But what Lance has learned is with a little effort and an open heart, it's possible to help others lighten the load. He used to come out quite a bit right after his death. You realize that uh, as a sudden death like this, you can just wipe out everything else. You know, he's going to be 17 forever. Is that what fuels you to 
keep up with the work? It is. You know, that's what keeps me going. My faith and the fact that uh, I truly believe I'll see him again someday. I'll be with him, and, and that's, that's what's given me the hope to continue. Our thanks to Trevor. If you or someone you know needs help, remember you are not alone. You can now call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988 or you can go to 988lifeline.org to chat with somebody. If you're a millennial, you might have grown up listening to them. And if you're a millennial parent, you may currently feel somewhat tortured by them. We bring you a behind the scenes look at the kids and the genius behind Kids Bob. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series streaming free on ABC News Live. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. From humble beginnings to earning a combined 43 million followers across several platforms, Bretman Rock has found a way to turn internet popularity into global fame. But there is more to the 24-year-old than just that. Arcana Whitworth traveled to Hawaii to meet Bretman and talk about therapy, family, gender expression, and the new season of his reality show. Where's the camera at? <laughs> Well, I'm Bremen Rock. I am a singer, songwriter, actor, actually activist, a scientist on the side. The star of Crystal Day, yay, yay, yay. Yeah. A coconut water connoisseur, the newest MTV star. I also am the owner of 15 chickens. 15 chickens? Yeah, I don't know how that happened. I had four. Even if you don't know the name, you've seen the face. His flair for fashion, care for attitude, and outlandish humor. You're a musician, girl. Have made him a social media sensation in high demand. Get in, loser. We're getting you a pair of crocs. Let's go. This is so gorgeous. The first openly gay man to grace the cover of Playboy. I also didn't want people to forget that I was a boy. I mean, to me, that makes the statement even more impactful. Take one action. Ah! The 24-year-old just wrapped his second season of Following Bretman Rock. <gasps> it's okay! 
big. Offering his combined 43 million followers a peek into his surprisingly low-key life. Girl, you're so dramatic. Not living in Los Angeles, but at his home in Hawaii this season, mental health became a main focus on his MTV show, his family by his side. You Girl, you, we grew up with a mother that don't even say I love you to us. We don't have to be like that. We flew to Hawaii to visit his sanctuary on the island of Oahu, surrounded by sprawling mountains with a view of the ocean, the place where he became a superstar. Born in the Philippines early on, Bretman's grandmother knew he was a star. She would always say, like, we don't have a word, the word famous in our language, so she would say things like, your name is very loud. But she would say, your, people are going to know you. People are going to know your name. But it wasn't until I came to the U.S. I was eight years old now. Two years later, I, our first stop was Walmart. And we, I saw myself in the CCTV. And I swear, I was like at the entrance of Walmart for like five minutes just admiring myself. I think that was when I realized, like, oh my God, this is what my grandma meant. She was his guiding light, celebrating Bretman's natural extravagance. She would introduce me to other people and be like, this is my handsome and pretty granddaughter. And, and sometimes she would say grandson. Like I was always handsome and pretty. And that part of my Filipino culture also was ingrained to me when I moved to Hawaii. By the time he was in high school, he'd become a budding star both on the track team and on social media with his sister, Princess May. I'm using the Morphe E27 brush. <laughs> I remembered hosting like the red carpet for Miss Universe when I, that was my first gig, girl. <laughs> I love But I came to school with a tiara that was given to me. No one cared when I went to school. Then my art teacher was like, all right, Brett, you missed two weeks of school. You're doing lunch duty. <laughs> so I had to cover up my tiara with the hairnet, <laughs> serving peaches. And that was when it hit me. I was like, wow, fame is really just subjective. His parents separating at a young age. Bretman, for the first time on camera with a therapist, confronts the guilt he's carried over believing he was at fault. I blame myself a lot for my sister not having a dad, and mom having a husband. That's not true. Your dad caused this. You're 24 years old, and you're essentially the breadwinner for your entire family. I feel like I put on that pressure on me at a very young age because of everything that went down when my mom and dad was divorcing. So I'm breadwinner by guilt, hmm. not by choice. I just want you guys to know that you guys are really breaking a lot of generational patterns. I feel like Asians normally are scared of showing signs of weakness. So seeing a therapist, I was like, girl, I'm not weak. I could do this myself. Mm -hmm. But um, very quickly, I realized that it is really not a sign of weakness at all. Welcome to my <laughs> office, Miss Kana. Oh, I love it. This is I where I it. keep my accomplishments, I guess. The fruits of some of my labors. We head into Bretman's office to see his drive in action. And and what about the People's Choice Awards? You were going through kind of an emotional time when you won that one, right? Yeah, I won it like a couple of days before my dad had passed. It, it's truly like one of those things, like when it rains, it pours vibes. Bretman faced the pitfalls of fame when some fans flooded his father's funeral in 2019. At the time, I just couldn't believe it. I didn't know why my dad's line was so long to see him. It didn't register in my brain until people had their phones out and like being like, condolences. And then they'd ask me for a picture. Yet, you also, I imagine, think of him every day as you're getting dressed. Mm -hmm because he was a bit of a fashion inspiration for he you. He really was. And he's actually the reason why I'm, I have such long hair now. Like, he had, like, long, long hair growing up. That exquisite love for unique fashion on clear display in his closet. This is the outfit that I wore when I was receiving my award for MTV Unscripted Series. This award is for all of the Asian Americans <laughs> who believe in me, all of the Pacific Islanders, and most importantly, this is for all of the LGBTQ do you ever in your mind identify a garment with a gender oh, or an energy? No, I or a... never did. When you grow up broke, 
you kind of don't have a choice. Like, my first skinny jeans were, like, my mom's. When you go to the swap meet, you know, they're not, they don't separate the clothes by men and women's clothes. You kind of just pick out what fits you. His love for the land also on display. It's easy to see why you wouldn't want to leave Hawaii. I mean, why would you? His time on the island dedicated to his family, his cousin Kiefer, known as Miss Kay, and sister Princess May, who joined Bretman in therapy to work on strengthening their relationship. Things that he does, like, action-wise, I'm like, okay, he doesn't have to tell me he's proud of me. I, he, I think him showing me that, like, he can be here for me. Seeing someone this confident, it helped a lot. Since he's so different, why can't I be different, too, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And what about his love life? Are you going to be a husband? I love that question. I will be a dad. With marriage on the back burner, Bretman is laser focused on a new endeavor. Well, I feel like a lot of really famous people write things. Um, and so I've been, you know, let's just say I've been journaling extra on in my book lately. That's quite a teaser. Just know I'm working on something. Why are you in my business? <laughs> Girl, you'll see it. <laughs> And up next, a look at a woman who's winning both on the court and in the recording studio. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. The worlds of hip-hop and basketball are both about to get a bit of a shake-up. Tonight, we want to introduce you to an up-and-coming Gen Z superstar. And thanks to new rules for collegiate athletes, she's able to make money while pursuing both of her passions. Deborah Roberts brings us a remarkable story. Well, what's going to separate you? What's going to make you different? I come from royalty. I come from greatness. No matter what, my kids are going to make it, and we're going to make it. It was just something about seeing that ball go through the hoop and like that splash and like everybody screaming like. <sighs> bar for bar, pound for pound, she may be one of the most unique athletes the NCAA's ever seen. We would be in here chilling though. We, we chill a lot. <laughs> you either gonna pay the price for doing it or you're gonna pay the price for not doing it. Flage Johnson has been doing it for her entire life and now she'll be doing it at LSU. Just having like a university saying like, we're offering you a full scholarship to attend our university, like that stuff means something. Like you're willing to like 
pay for my education, pay for this, just for me to, you know, play basketball and represent. Kia remembers her daughter's journey the way only a mother could. When she was little, you're trying to give her the things that you give a little girl. You put her in ballet. But she didn't love it. She didn't love it, but it helped her. Footwork. I said, well, what do you want to do? And she goes, I want to play basketball. And I said, basketball? There's no four-year-old girls playing basketball. And Coach Maurice was like, listen, just put on a team with the boys. So I put on a team with the boys, and hell, <laughs> it's been hell ever since. <laughs> Not only is Flaget getting an opportunity most student athletes only dream of, she's also getting a business opportunity most have never had. I'm gonna pop it every time. I told him, like, I don't take nothing lightly here. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is all a blessing for me because I could have been in a whole another predicament. Flaget's in the right place at the right time. Legislation allowing college athletes to profit from their name, image, and likeness, called NIL, is now in effect. I'll be taking my athletic and academic career to Louisiana State University. Go Tigers. If you had been uh, coming of age for college basketball a few years ago, mm -hmm. you would have been restricted about what you can do. Yep. You came along during a time where now you can sort of own a piece of whatever it is you want to do. Crazy. What is that like? God just blessed me. Like, these, honestly, like, think about it. Like, what's the odds that I'm going to get stuck right in this NIL thing and, you know, be able to capitalize, like, I can take care of my family for generations just what I do in these four years right here. Like, people don't understand how big, big of an opportunity that is. I'm not taking it for granted. Like, everything I got to do, I'll make sure I do it. The new NIL rules mean Flaget can cash in without worrying about her other passion, which is good news for her because, as it turns out, when she isn't dishing dimes on the court, she's dropping gems on the mic. At some point, it wasn't just basketball. Music. Yeah. I feel like I'm speaking for the people who ain't got a voice. I with nearly a million followers on social media and a distribution deal with Jay-Z's Rock Nation, Flaget has the potential to be one of the highest earning student athletes ever. Oh, God, you lie. Oh, God, you lie. Oh, God, you lie. You're 18. Uh, That's a lot of pressure. It, uh, Are you putting pressure on yourself, or do you even feel it? I don't feel the pressure, because pressure make diamonds, like, you know what I'm saying? I like diamonds. <laughs> I love diamonds. <laughs> This diamond has been shining bright from an early age. I see you got a special guest, too. Yeah, man, I got my little, my little partner gonna hang out with me. You wanna tell everybody who you are? Fla J. You've been on America's Got Talent. Yeah. I mean, you've been, you faced Simon Cowell. Ooh. What was that like? That was crazy. I believe we are witnessing the start of somebody's career big time. Oh, my God. I really do. And Simon Cowell just told me I'm a star, like, you know how many people he booed off the stage? Like, he just told me I'm a star. Let's go! A moment young Flaget took in stride and learned from. Deborah, it was a roller coaster. It was a roller coaster because the internet was in, in full of flack and yeah. people were so mean to her. When you say people were so mean, what kinds of things did people say? I remember one time he's like, you won't be like your dad, you stop, stop rapping, all that, all that. And they left my daddy in the street, my grandma full of pain. You never had a chance to know your father. He was gone before you were even born. Yep. So how is it you were able to connect with him? I don't know. You know, he died, but still, that's a connection that we share through music. It's like I feel like an energy whenever I'm making music. It's been the food steps and welfare, yeah. but ain't nobody care. Her dad, getting this big old record deal, getting all his money, millions of dollars, this was a new life for him, too. Um, so he left, he went to the studio, and then I got a call. Somebody was like, Jason been shot. What did you know about your dad? I just knew that he was a storyteller and like a poet, and he really spoke for the people who didn't really have a voice. When you learned that he was gunned down, it was a crime that was never solved, mm -hmm. how did that affect you? It affect me more than I thought it would. And they ain't giving us nothing to get their head down yet. So all these young cats out here who ain't never been to high school and all they know is the streets, they struggle, you know? I was a single mom raising her, you know what I'm saying? Like, Jason's death was sudden for all of us. Her and her daddy are alike in so many ways, you know, because they they actually have this personality that's just so huge, and and they can make people just gravitate to them. And that was Jason. Yeah, I call him Jason. <laughs> Camouflage was his rap name. You were pregnant uh, at the time. You knew you were going to have a little girl. Where did the name Flage come from? Oh my God, Deborah, that was not going to be her name. <laughs> he come. I'm naming my baby Flage Monet. 
But we argued three to, three to four days about that name. But after he passed away, well, like a month later, I was like, this is the last big decision that he's going to be to make for her. So, Flage? Flage Monet. Flage. <laughs> Flage is in the building. Flage is Camouflage's daughter, man. That's what's up. It's good to finally meet you, young lady. I heard you got skills. Yes, I do. Was that pressure for you to feel like you want to sort of represent your dad? My mom was like, I'm sorry to tell you, like, you're never going to be able to do that. Like, he wears a size 10, you wear a size 8. Like, you're never going to be able to fill that up. But she always told me, like, Fla, like, the day going to come where you're going to realize you're going to have your own legacy. Like, you've done so much for your father with the basketball and the music. It's like, wow, basketball, I have my own legacy, and I'm still carrying my dad's with music. So, you know, it all panned out the right way. From baby girl to shining star. And here I'm more vulnerable, you know what I mean? Like, I'm way more vulnerable in the studio because that's why I let, let everything out. You can't let people in here if they vibe ain't good because it'll break the whole thing. I hope my, my vibe is okay. Your vibe good. You could get on the mic. Your oh, vibe good. Good. <laughs> oh, I got a good vibe. Any heroes for you growing up besides your dad, basketball or music? Just my mom, for real. Like, when I'm ready to give up on her and I'm like, it's, it's too hard, I be thinking like, my mom could have gave up so many times, and she didn't. You know what I'm saying? So that's my biggest mother. As a mom, that gets me. Your yeah. mom is your hero. For sure. I don't see her being nothing but an inspiration to other little girls. I can show little girls, like, it's another way to do it. And you can keep it clean. You can keep positive, And you can impact people for real. You know what I mean? So keeping that positive energy. And that's how I am. Ah! Back. Got the whole crew back, PJ High flew back. PJ. Pull up with my ice and it's cold like the wind in the summer lit, but I'm frozen. Like that. that wasn't a real song though. Uh, that was just. I figure you still Yeah, man. That was great. That was great. <laughs> You're the best. You know that? You're something Thank else. You. Wow. That's See, I'll be good. Our thanks to Deborah. So they sing, they dance, they tour, and they have somehow solidified themselves in pop culture infamy. Kids Bop crafts chart-topping hits into kid-friendly jams, some of which have been played in front of parents again and again and again and again. Well, you get the point. So what's the story behind the music giant and who are the kids' stars at the center of it all? Our Will Carr got a behind-the-scenes access to find out. With nearly 3 billion views, over 23 million album sales, and 24 albums that debuted in the top 10 of the Billboard 200, it's my first class. they're the best-selling artists you probably don't know about. I really want to be a kids bop kid. Will DJ pump up the kids bop? <laughs> is a phenomenon that takes some of pop's biggest hits and turns them into kid-friendly tunes. The kids bop band comes out and they're rocking out all the cover songs and <laughs> and uh, at one point I looked over and our two girls are leaning over the balcony like this just going crazy. <laughs> Selling nearly 300,000 tickets in 2019, the kids are back on tour for the first time since the pandemic. We met the voices behind the music at their practice in Los Angeles where we got behind-the-scenes access to watch the group perfect their routines ahead of their return to the stage. Right now, this whole few weeks has been setting up the show, conditioning, getting them ready, getting their lungs ready and their bodies ready for strength and to be able to perform on stage and, and do this hour-and-a-half show. For people who don't even know what Kids Bop is, explain to them what it is. So, for Kids Bop, we take all the top hits and sing them by kids for kids. And the artists behind the music Are you ready to get this party started? Kids themselves. Thousands auditioned. And Kids Bop chose Cammy, Egan, Dominic, and Layla for these heavily sought-after roles. We'll train the kids, get them ready to hit the road. Um, and we take a couple months, actually, before we put the show on the road, where we design all elements between the wardrobe, the production, the stage design. This has been my first job, so it was new at first, but I love the team, I love who I work with. I even got into the fun, trying out a few moves myself. Oh, oh wait, wait, yeah, I didn't know we were starting. Yeah, it was Two, oh. wait, wait, <laughs> ready, go! go. And before you know it, we made my first ever TikTok. <laughs> and that's my first TikTok. 
Launching in the U.S. in 2001, Kids Bop goes way back for a lot of fans. Today's biggest songs made just for kids, newly recorded from the Kids Bop Kids. Hey now, you're not star. And if you guys have heard of Kids Bop, and woo, we love it over here. Even your favorite celebrities are fangirling, from Chrissy Teigen to Kerry Washington to Jenna Fisher. Girls, hit your hallelujahs. I remember hearing about Kids Bop when I was like really little. Every day I'm shuffling. And I just like love to like listen to Kids Bop and perform. So being here right now on Kids Bop is like a dream come true. So whenever I saw them, I was super in awe about all the sets, like the costumes that they wore. I just thought it was super cool. And I was like, oh my gosh, I could be that someday. <laughs> Well, I see myself like still continuing to be a performer because I eventually like want to be like my own solo artist and like tour around the U.S. And for some of these tweeners with big dreams, big breaks come next. You. From Zendaya to Becky G. For Cami, Egan, Layla, and Dominic, right. the road to singing, dancing, and performing in front of large, screaming fans starts here. How many people are they going to be performing in front of each night? So it's anywhere between like 10 and 15,000. Um, wow. What are the sacrifices that go along with that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is actually the parents. You know, the parents are kind of sacrificing a lot. On, on their part of like having to bring the kids to rehearsals and auditions and basically travel across the country with the tour. All of their hard work coming together, bringing energy from TikToks A, B, C, D, e, you. right to the stage. We made the trip to Connecticut to watch it all come together in their opening show. We are the kids walk kids. So of course there's little mistakes here and there learning new choreography. Mm -hmm. So even through the the tougher times or the, the rougher, harder days, yeah. we all pull through for each other. Sometimes it can be hard, but all of my family, all my friends are super supportive, and all of our team here is incredible. You can fly away with me tonight. We've got a brand new dance. Move you gotta move your muscle. I just wanna look into your eyes. I'm in Kids Bob US and in Kids Bob in Espanol. I feel like really proud that I'm able to do that and I'm able to be in both groups. I'm definitely like proud of like how far we've gotten like mm -hmm. since we started rehearsals and to see the progress from where we started. Mm -hmm. I think for myself pushing through on days where I was tired or just wanted to like relax but going to work and dancing and singing and performing just like so get to this point and I think it'll all pay off whenever I step yeah. on the stage. Our thanks to Will for that. And that's our show for tonight. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever